watching the show. We don't want them to think about how they did that. Exactly. We just want it to wash over them. And after it prepares, first you <clears throat> button your fly. <laughs> Are we on? <laughs> If you can see that there are people working backstage, we're doing something wrong. Right. It should look so flawless and so easy and just, you know, the sound of music flowing over the mountains. <laughs> there are over a thousand people standing in the pouring rain waiting to get into the sound of music. But we're going to take you backstage to see how this well-oiled machine works so that when they see it out front, they don't even have any idea what goes on. The average audience member has absolutely no idea how much goes in to putting on a show. Well, and basically we don't want them to. <laughs> I mean, people watching this program are obviously interested. And it's great so that they can see it on a generic level of this is a show, this is how a show works, or this is how the electrician on a show works. But when they're out there in the audience watching the show, we don't want them to think about how they did that. Exactly. We just want it to wash over them. We want them to follow the story. That's what we're doing is telling a story. Well, we have about 800 uh, lights on the show, and they're all over, overhead, left and right, and out front, balcony position, box booms, uh, light pipe up front there. We have uh, audio speakers on that, and uh, automated moving lights on that, too that they can be computerized to, to move and to, to follow and put the light where you need it at any given time. It's a huge <clears throat> clip up and the altar will come up from down in the base. Oh, wow. And when we look off to the wings, right. we see scenery, we see lights. Everything in the world. And, and there, there's uh, part of the uh, scenery is uh, flown in the air. So when one comes on, they'll take the other one down and get it ready to come on. And then they'll take one off and they'll fly that out to get it out of the way. You have a limited amount of room. Our job is to work with the stage management and the carpenter on, the, on stage that visually watches everything for safety purposes and we basically move scenery via a computer system and an automation system which is behind us here that controls all these winches, uh, hydraulic pumps, lifts. Virtually every automated access is controlled through this system here. Uh, that, that's basically our job, is to move scenery as safely as possible in conjunction and on cue with the show. And a big responsibility. Uh, yes. If you can see that there are people working backstage, we're doing something wrong. Right. It should look so flawless and so easy and just, you know, the sound of music flowing over the mountains. You know? <laughs> what I do for six, eight hours a day is keep the clothes put back together. Um, you know, opening night when the designs are totally set, then it's my job to keep them as close to that perfection as it was opening night. We've been running a year now, so, you know, it, little by little, as time goes on, it's more difficult to keep those things up. Right. These are the actual sketches for the, the original designs for the show. What time does your day start and what time does it end? On a matinee day, um, I'm here around 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning. Wow. And on a matinee two show day, which today is not, today we just have a matinee, but I'll be here from 10 in the morning to 11 at night. On a dress like this, which is quite expensive, I would guess it's around $6,000 gown. Um, wow. Uh, if in fact the other person would fit in this, we would probably use this. But because she didn't, we did another, we had another one made. What happens if you have an actor mm -hmm. and they gain a little weight and their costume doesn't start fitting the way I give them it. a little talking to, <laughs> but I usually tell actors, I gladly take things in, but I don't like letting them out. <laughs> so <laughs> people usually are pretty good. Somebody went blind doing these beads. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it used, well, you know, it used this to be nuns in the old days, right? This yeah. is kind of ironic it's in this show. very difficult now. <laughs> right, I wish we had them. Where are they? Um, yeah, it's very difficult. I mean, the beating, just the, the technique of beating is becoming lost. It's difficult to find the people. A lot of them are from Europe, Middle European countries. Right. Um, and we love them because, it, you know, they do it on big looms. It's all work from the back. It's a, it's a, it's a huge process to do this.
I, I and for me, it's not a problem just to fill in little areas because I do one at a time by hand. They they use a, a crochet system, working from the back side of the fabric, with a little small crochet hook that brings up. And you know, you've probably worn a dress when you see a, a little thread and you pull it and it goes. The thing goes. Yeah. Thing, in the final fitting, um, I'll take a pack of cigarettes if I don't have anything else and put it basically where we'd be wearing the mic pack because it gives you a little yeah on fitted garments especially it's a it's a sometimes a problem to find a place to put them even though now when i was an actor they have those big vegas remember those big packs that were like huge yeah we've got now the sennheisers which are quite small in reality but they do make a difference on something like this which is a very sleek fit a lot of times we'll put them on the inner thigh so that the outside silhouette doesn't isn't disturbed i see yeah now, if somebody pops a button right during the show, somebody has to Ooh, be there real we, fast. We knock wood about that. Yeah, that's, yeah, I'll run around. And <laughs> but generally speaking, the things are looked over so well before the show actually goes up that that won't happen. Yeah. That's why we're here so early in the morning to check all the hooks, all the snaps, all the... It's a big job. Plus, we have ten dressers that actually work with the actors. I don't go into the show backstage and, you know, right. I stay here and do this. But there's ten people that keep, you know, those clothes, all the pressing, all the steaming. And they're here four hours before each show. Generally speaking, you know, an audience member doesn't realize how many people there are that work backstage in a Broadway musical. Uh, it can be, I think we have maybe 40 to 50 people uh, total here. I mean, there's lots of, lots of people involved. And uh, it's a big family. It has to work like a family or you're really in trouble. Because we basically live together here. You know, we're here eight shows a week. And that's a lot of time spent. More time I spend with my family. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And sometimes that's a good thing. <laughs> this, is, this is George, Bonnie, and George. And you're all on this huge console during all through the show. I have never, there's a lot of machinery, a lot of knobs. Yes, it is. Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, the sound department as a whole uh, controls everything that's heard in the show. You see the names of the characters displayed in the center section. The, for this scene, we just have the captain and Brigida and these various people that we're controlling. Then the next scene may change that entirely. Uh, go to the next, the names change. Uh, as we need them for that scene. So rather than us scurrying down and finding the person or scurrying down here, we're just working it from a central location as needed. Wow. Now, these monitors are, are for what? Uh, the top one there is the conductor monitor, uh, a picture of the conductor up close. Uh, that I see and that they see all over the theater. Pretty much everyone follows him. All the performers are wearing radio mics on their heads. So it's your job to, when they go off stage, to turn that mic off so that we don't hear the backstage uh, conversation? Is that? Yes, <laughs> yes. That's the dream. <laughs> now, who would be the person that actually decides that, you know, the mic goes back here or wherever or where the wires well, go so that you don't see it? Sometimes um, the actor will actually say, I like to have my mic here or here or here, you know, sometimes they'll say, and if the costume allows, then they can do whatever, you know, they can pretty much do what they want. That's really rare. <laughs> That's no. the, the joy of live theater. theater. <laughs> it is. The joy of life, live theater is getting to know your co-workers as you go burrowing around under their clothing. It could... Hi, Dennis. Do you mind if we came visit you when they put your mic in your mouth? I'm asking you, and you can't say no. <laughs> yes, he can. Yes. No, it's, we hope you will. It's, it's fine. It's fine. That's an interesting uh, <laughs> process. Yes, yes, you do your hair so well. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, come on okay. by. Sure. Great. About thank you. Thank you. Okay. And after it prepares. That's right. <clears throat> First, you <clears throat> button your fly. <laughs> Are we on? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is fairly typical, I think. Uh, the actors typically wear their transmitter, which is in here. Actually, let me show it to you before we get all excited. Transmitter has batteries in it, has a little red light, tells you it's on, has an antenna, and has a microphone. And uh, that's the size of the mic. So the actors wear their transmitters somewhere on their person, depending on their costume and and other factors where yes, they're comfortable with it. We have these little toupee clips on the microphone. I don't know if you can I can see it. See it's them. Just, yeah. Just, uh, they are 
uh, sewn on to the cable. We do that for each actor depending on their hairstyle uh, and their head. We put them on in different places so it's going to sit on their head appropriately. Yeah. It's it's fabulous because you don't even see out. it. Yeah, that's the so idea. many shows you see, you know, this big thing here or here where it's really noticeable. Yeah, well, we, we certainly try to avoid that. Uh, I'm not done back here. Uh, of course <laughs> not. Of course. of course not. Once you get used to them, I mean, you have the advantage of um, you don't have to project to the back of the house on every word, so you can have a, a much uh, wider range of uh, uh, volume. If I'm in an intimate scene, you know, at very close range, uh, I don't want to be shouting. Right. Ideally, and if I this this affords me the ability not to have to speak real loudly. Well, I've it watched hurt. it go in, and I can't even see it. I mean, that is really professional. It's fabulous. This it's is the terrible. hair off the head. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, we're. <laughs> We're now, we see Rebecca's mic just going over. This is my the, hair. Yeah, right. we'll put it underneath the hair piece. We use our own front and incorporate it with the back piece, and it looks more realistic that way. We hide the mic right there so nobody can see it. Yeah. yeah. That's kind sweet. of invisible. That's terrific. Isn't that great? No. Let me just sort of braid it, um, <laughs> braid it into my own hair like that. And all this time, we thought I had long, long, long braided hair. That's right. The period show, which this is, um, it's very hard to get a period look from someone's ordinary hair. Uh, it just makes it easier every day wear. Um, it's just a lot. It's too much for them to worry about, you know. And it's, uh, these wigs are, are done by Paul Huntley, so they look... They look really good. Oh, you, will, you, will this microphone be covered a, slightly with, with hair so you don't actually see it? Or? Uh, slightly, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's, it's not real noticeable, all, though. Only the tip, and it's yeah. the color of my hair, so no one really ever ever sees it. Between Carol and I, we both tin it. <laughs> right. now, tin it in every night. You being the star, you get star treatment, and you, you get somebody actually doing nice? this for you. I know. I don't, I don't think I would, you know, I'd have to come in at 4.30 if I did my own hair. <laughs> what time do you actually have to come in? I, I arrive about an hour and a half before curtain. That's still uh, not half hour. Two, it's not an hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. Carol, what time do you have to get me here? Uh, about an hour and a half as well, before half hour. Do I have a wig, a full wig, but um, that's because there's no time to take my hair down and set it at intermission, so we, it's, a, it's a necessity. And, uh, and like Carol said, Paul Huntley's wigs are so, uh, the lace is thin and it looks so natural. You know, it's a little thinner than most the, theatrical lace wigs. Right. Right, you right. Know. They're called movie lace. Yeah, and um, I barely tell. So they look. Uh, and I take awful. it these wigs are rather expensive if they are so yeah. high quality. Mm -hmm. Very. This is a probably this is a real hair, uh, right? Real hair. Wow. Wig. Yes, human and hair. It does feel comes like. from Russia. Um, and it's almost like virgin hair. Hmm. Just a lot healthier. Hair. And so, so you're you're leaving, and where are you going? Uh, well, don't really know. I'm going to be working on a few albums, and and uh, just um, just relaxing and be having a life so that until something else comes along. Basically. So do you know who's going to replace you? Yeah, my understudy, uh, Laura Benanti. Ah, nineteen year old, her. nineteen year old Laura Benanti. Yeah, it's a great. There you go. It's a, the break it's a great. Wait for it's, her. A, no, it's, a, it's a great, great thing for her. It is. She's lovely. Yeah. So she takes over with Richard Chamberlain. Wow. On March 10th. Well, that's a very nice big break for her. Yeah. Yeah. Big one. Huge. Oh, bless you. I hope, I hope I work again, as all actors ask themselves after they leave a show, you know? I wonder. Voila. Voila. <laughs> Every show. I actually don't work at this desk too often. I mean, I do paperwork here, but I mostly work out there. I'm either at the call desk uh, calling the show, or I do occasionally run a deck on either side, or I'm out in the house watching the show. And I try and sit here and make all of this mess go away <laughs> as quickly as possible, because it's rehearsal schedules and it's uh, mail from fans that has to go to the cast and all, all sorts of stuff like that. Over here we've got contact sheets and uh, calendars that indicate uh, a myriad of things. If an actor is out, 
we know which understudies go on. My job is essentially, uh, along with my, uh, my team of stage managers, to be the organizational center for the show. Uh, I um, sort of the funnel through which all communication right, can happen. Schedules are set and please. rehearsals are, are set up. Um, I am responsible for helping to maintain the artistic integrity of the show as it was left on opening night by the director and the choreographer and everybody uh, to give notes to the playing company and to rehearse understudies and replacements. And we, we call it running the deck, which basically means there's a stage manager on either side, uh, just sort of watching that everything goes smoothly, that the actors are safe and that props are being set, et cetera. Uh, it's a lot of responsibility it that is, goes it along is, with it, this. It is. <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely a 40-plus hour a week job. This is our 374th performance. Hello, sir. We are ready. Thank you, Electrics 2. Go. Thank you. Okay, we're going to do it. Thank you. All right, bye bye. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. On five on the red, six on the blue. Morning, fly one on the red. House to half. Vanessa Brown, and I'm one of the child wranglers here on The Sound of Music, uh, which means that we're in charge of the children from the time their parents drop them off before the show until they pick them up when they come back. And we help them get dressed and get into their microphones and get, take them to their cues on stage and basically make sure they have cookies if they need them. Sometimes it's the most important thing. <laughs> Um, we've had a scare now because flu is going around and we have kids who are out and kids who are sick and there's always the game, what if both of the boys are sick and they only have one understudy to cover them, what will happen? And the kids love to play that game, but so far it hasn't come up. And that's always kind of a terrifying idea. I get here about uh, 45 minutes before the show starts. Uh, and I leave about 15 minutes after it ends. Uh, and, you know, before the kids are in the building, they all have to be here at uh, 25 after the hour, so at uh, 35 minutes before the show starts. And uh, they come in and they do a vocal warm-up with the musical supervisor, and then they get into their costumes, and they do their makeup. And then they usually do another warm-up with the director, which they're in doing now, with the assistant choreographer. And he's warming them up. And uh, then they go on and they do the show. Hi, hey, I'm Jamie. Hello. <coughs> nice Hello. To meet you. And this is Hello. Tracy Allison Walsh. Hello. And you are Christina Ambry. 
Hi, Chris. Almost have everybody. I think we're only <clears> missing <throat> two. So, guys, you want to come in here for a second? I'm Lou Taylor Pucci. I'm 13 and I play Friedrich. Friedrich. I'm Marshall Taylor. I'm 11 and I play Court. Court. I'm Andrea Bowen and I'm 8 and I play Marta. I'm going to be 9 on in March. I'm Christiana Ambry and I'm 8 and I play Gretel. I'm Tracy Walsh and I play Brigitte and I just turned 11. I'm Nora Blacko and I'm 13 years old and I play Louisa. Louisa! What are you playing? Jet Moto. What? Jet, Jet Moto. Moto. It's a racing game. Who's the best at it? Me. No, Nora. No? Get out of here. We have a really good group of kids here. You know, people always want to hear like horrible children's stories, but they're not. We have really good kids here. I miss you. Be good. Okay. This is our wig dryer. It's um, it's a wooden wig dryer, and it's a. It's a food heater, and a, in between shows, we heat our food up in there. <laughs> I start the show as a nun, and uh, I'm dressed in my wimple, and then uh, in the middle of the show, I become a party guest, and I get to put on makeup and a beautiful wig, left by Natasha, and a um, uh, lovely gown, and uh, go out and with my champagne glass and have a good time for a little while, and it really uh, it helps me uh, it gives you something to look forward to through the show. It's like you've got these wonderful uh, dynamics and different people to be. So it's really, it's fun. And here's the big. For your pose. Voila. I play two parts. I play Sister Berta at the beginning, who sing uh, How Do You Solve a Problem Like Maria? And the, she's the mean one, the flibberty gibbet nun. And then this is my trio, the Singerbund, where we come out and we uh, yodel at the party and win at the end. Third prize. Third prize. Up close, you can see this teeny, teeny little film, but from the back of the house, Can't there's see it. no way that you can see that. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's, it is. It's, and I believe if, if this is film lace, so that it's so fine. Is that right, Carol? That's the right. film lace? Yes. It's so fine, it can't be seen. It's amazing. It doesn't. It feels so light. The wig is so light on our head. And it was an instant change like that. Instant. Boom. You like this. Couldn't really do it any other way because if you were, your hair is all pulled back under a habit or whatever they call them. Yeah, and we have it all preset in the beginning. We all pin curl our hair and we put wig caps on, and so we're set to go. And then we take off our wimples and come up here, and they. We're on. Now, I understand you just got married. I did. Well, that's pretty good for a nun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just got married two weeks ago, City Hall. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's well, wonderful. best wishes Thank to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, you're Thank welcome. Thank you. Have you a good day. Continued success with the show. Thank you very much. I'll go yodel now. OK. I'm Laura Benanti, and I'm 19 years old. And I'm being transformed into elegant party guest number two. And um, starting March 10th, I'm going to be replacing Rebecca as uh, Maria Rayner, opposite Richard Chamberlain, um, and that's that. <laughs> this is very exciting that an understudy gets to step yeah. into the lead role and take over. It's pretty over. amazing, and especially such a wonderful person like Rebecca. I mean, she's amazing. But she seems she very really supportive is. of you, which uh, is very nice. Unbelievably supportive. I mean, I have, like, cards and cards and cards from her in my dressing room just saying how excited she is, and, you know, she's just a wonderful role model. This is not the norm, as you may, uh, as you may have heard. That's what they keep telling me. And this was your <laughs> very first Broadway show on top of it? Yeah, I went right from high school into this. Actually, I went to NYU for a week. A week? Yes, learned everything I needed to know and left. <laughs> well, it, it came about, I guess, a couple months ago. They were talking about it, because I, I guess Rebecca was leaving or, or what have you. And um, they mentioned to me, Richard Frankel called me at home, um, and he mentioned to me that you know, they were thinking of me as a replacement, but they weren't sure there's a lot of names in the mix. And then they called me in to audition with Richard Chamberlain, and I did that. Um, and then it just kind of happened. <laughs> I, I can't describe it. It was exciting um, and scary. And um, 
I get, really can't describe it. It felt like a fairy tale. I know that sounds really stupid to say, but it truly did. Like, I, I was there with my mom when I found out, and she, we just looked at each other like, this doesn't happen. You know, we both started to cry. <laughs> so that was it. I mean, I remember when they told me I was going to be understudying Rebecca and that I was going to be a nun, and I was started to cry. So this has been like nine months of just sheer fantasy for me. But now I have to go sing off stage with the kids. <laughs> We were shooting backstage, but then we heard that Maria was getting dressed for her wedding in the lobby. So now you know, Maria gets Captain Von Trapp. But there's a lot more to this show, and we're not telling you any more. You're going to have to come back and see it for yourself. I had forgotten what a great show The Sound of Music is. Look, we just came out of the matinee, and a thousand other people are standing in line for the next evening performance. You know, the best fairy tales are the true stories. Whether it be Maria Von Trapp and the Von Trapp family singers or the story of a 19-year-old unknown understudy who takes over the role as Maria, following in the footsteps of Rebecca Luker, Mary Martin, and Julie Andrews. So go to the Martin Beck Theater, see this Rodgers and Hammerstein classic. It's now starring Richard Chamberlain and Laura Benanti, directed by Susan H. Schulman. You'll have a great time. It's very exciting. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I won't give away the ending, but, uh, but they get away from the Nazis. <laughs> thank God. Yeah. We want to thank the various unions for, without whose consent this visit could not take place.